Good morning. Certainly thankful to see each of you here this morning. Uh, I know last week JP got up here and and he sounded like he had a little bit of thing going and and I guess I've inherited that as well. With it being allergy season, I sound about the same. Um, but I appreciate you bearing with me this morning. We're going to be talking about wisdom for graduates, and we're going to be looking at three basic areas of wisdom. Now, this lesson and the areas of wisdom that, of which we will discuss it will impact every individual and every, every area of life. And so, uh, specifically, of course, we're going to be looking and focusing upon those that are the graduates, but as already stated, it will apply all the way across the board to every single New Testament Christian. And so here are the three things that I want us to look at. Number one, don't lose focus. Number two, count the cost of sin. And number three, decide now. All of those can apply all the way across the board. The first thing that I want us to look at is that we do not need to lose focus. Now, Satan is busy and he is good at what he does and he continuously comes after us and tries to get us to lose our focus. But we need to make sure that we keep our eye upon the prize. We don't need to let our spiritual priorities become an afterthought, but that's what Satan will do. He will convince us that those things that are spiritual are not very important. And those things that are material and physical are of the highest priority, and he will try to get us to shift around our perspective to only see what's here upon this earth and not look beyond that to eternity. And so we must make sure that we do not allow Satan to shift our focus. We don't want to throw away our spiritual inheritance for some temporary, easy pleasure. Now let's go to the, our text. We're going to look at a couple of different ones. Let's look at Genesis chapter 25. Now in Genesis chapter 25, we read uh, of Isaac, and he had two sons. We have Jacob and we have Esau. And we can see the, the promise that was made by God in verse 23. The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now when we look at an inheritance, there are two parts of an inheritance. There's the blessing, and then there is the birthright. And in this passage, we can see what a blessing would be. That is that the head of the extended family, when the father dies, the head of the extended family, generally speaking, would be the one that is the eldest. But the Lord God said that the youngest is the one that would receive the blessing. Now, we can see that Isaac tried to shift that around. He tried to give that to Esau, or at least that was his intention. But ultimately, the promise was to go to Jacob. And we can see that from verse 23 because that was the prophecy. That's what the Lord said was to be the case. But then there is the birthright. Now, the birthright, generally speaking, Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 17 Deuteronomy 21 and 17 tells us that that would be a double portion of an inheritance for the one that is the eldest. The double portion. So you have two sons. That means that Isaac's estate is going to be broken up into thirds. There's going to be three parts of that estate. The oldest is going to receive two thirds. The youngest is going to receive one third. And that's what it means by having that double portion, the individual that would be the oldest. So then we read about an incident that occurred here where we have Esau who was a cunning hunter according to verse 27. And we have uh, Jacob who was just a plain man dwelt in tents and Esau had been out. And the Bible says that, that he was basically faint. He was famished as he came in from the field. And Jacob is there. And the Bible says in verse 29 that he sawed pottage. Now that doesn't sound very appetizing to me. Sawed pottage. 
But what does that mean? Well, he was boiling pottage, the American Standard Version says. The Amplified says it this way. He cooked reddish-brown lentil stew. Now, that's, that's sounding a little bit more like it, a little better. And if you look up Strong's, it says that this is something that's boiled like a soup, and that's what pottage means. Brown's Drivers Briggs says it's a kind of boiled leguminous food, and a legume means beans, peas, or lentils. And I think there are other various translations that say this was a vegetable soup. So he's, he's got this lentil stew that he has made, and clearly he was pretty good at it because it smelled good, and you've got Esau who's come in, and he sees this, and he's hungry. Now, the sad state is that here you have Esau who was going to receive two-thirds and he gave up uh, of that double portion of his estate and gave it to his brother. Over what exactly? Over a bowl of beans or bean stew or bean soup or however you want to put it. That's what he did. In the moment there and, and made a... a unwise decision he threw away something so valuable and so precious his birthright in a moment of weakness satan will do that to you he will cause you to come to places in your life in which you have a moment of weakness in which maybe you are frail you are weak you are faint and he will put before you something that in the moment looks good but I'm telling you, after he had his, uh, his belly full, it was sour to him. He made a big mistake. Why do we know that? Well, in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 34, we find that, that he, it, was, it was something that he despised. Matter of fact, it says, thus Esau despised his birthright. He despised it. This is not something that afterward he said, man, I made a good deal, you know. Man, I, I took my brother for that bowl of soup, best bowl of soup I've ever had. I'm never going to take that back. I'm glad I made that decision. You know, we say hindsight's twenty twenty. After he got on the other side of that thing, he said, now, <laughs> why did I do this? Look, look he, he lost focus. He lost his perspective. In the moment... In the, in the midst of a temptation, he allowed the, the better sense of him to become overwhelmed and no longer was he thinking rationally and he made a bad decision. That's what Satan wants you to do. In a moment, in, just a, 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 in the moment of a temptation, just one decision, your whole life can be changed. If you lose focus upon what's really important, Satan will sneak in and in just one moment, everything can change. Your whole life can turn upside down. You say, oh, it's just one drink. It's just one smoke. It's just one pill. It's just a small decision and yet your life can change forever. You may end up in jail. You may have a record, criminal record for the rest of your life. You may take someone else's life. You may be addicted for the rest of your life. Just one small decision. Oh, it's just one night. And then you may be a parent. You see, there are decisions that we make in which Satan will come in and he, he will try to tempt us to lose focus upon what's really important. In a moment, in a matter of weakness, we will make the wrong choices. In Hebrews chapter 11 is another example of an individual who had a, a rather large choice to make, but he made the right choice. If you go to Hebrews chapter 11, we call this the hall of faith, and it's individuals who chose God. In the midst of this, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 24 through 26, we read of... Moses, and it says in verse 24, by faith Moses, when he had come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, had he done so, had he chosen rather to align as Pharaoh's daughter, his life would have been a life of ease, 
a life of wealth and riches. He would have had a very affluent lifestyle if he had taken on that role and assumed that. But instead, he chose something very different. He chose, rather, in verse 25, to suffer affliction. He chose the people of God, that is, those that he derived from, and by doing so, he chose, rather, instead to enjoy this type of lifestyle of affliction instead of the pleasures of sin for a season. He could have had that lifestyle, but it would have been the pleasures of sin for a season. He could have lost focus. He did not. Satan was there trying to get him to lose focus, but he chose correctly. And so we need to make a choice to follow God rather than riches. Young people that often graduate now, they're maybe looking at a career, or maybe even learning, looking at a higher level of education and then a career. Sometimes they, they will put those riches as the, the, the highest priority. And, and sometimes we do a pretty good job of putting that before our children. Unfortunately, we say uh, your career is more important than God. And we show that by what we choose first, our career or worship. Sadly, that is the case in some places. We need to make sure that we show as parents the proper path that God is always first over career. And that's important. And it needs to be preached, it needs to be shown, it needs to be practiced. And so we need to make sure that we do so, but sometimes we do a poor job of saying, well, your Bible class lesson, your memory verse, not as important. You need to focus on schoolwork. And we put that up front, and that's the highest priority in children's life, and we raise them that way. And we're surprised that when we, they go out in life that their career and riches and gain is the most important thing in their life, and God just falls to the backside. And no longer are they faithful in worship to God. Listen, we need to make sure as parents, number one, that we maintain focus. And then young people, as they leave that home, that they keep that focus upon God and never lose sight of what is important. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 6, that's the encouragement that is given in Matthew chapter 6. That if we maintain our spiritual priority in life, that God will provide. Though we may think that we have to go out and that all the provisions of life rely upon us, ultimately God is the one that gives all good blessings and all good gifts. We have to have enough faith to rely upon Him. I've seen several circumstances while working overseas of individuals in which I would have to I would be teaching them the Bible and explain what repentance is and as in explaining what repentance is and, and explaining how they would have to change their life, they would have to give up their livelihood, their income, their home, everything in order to follow Jesus Christ and become a Christian. So which one is more important? Well, every time we would tell them, look, if you put God first, if you obey the gospel and you put Him first and you follow Him, God will provide. And that takes a lot of faith. But that's exactly what we preach and we need to live in that way because that's exactly what the passage here shows us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Keep on seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Worry doesn't do any good. And that's what verse 34 would teach us. And so we need to rely upon God. If you go back and look at the context, when he says these things, he's talking about those basic provisions of life. If we believe that we're the only one that provides that and we don't need God for that, we've lost our focus and we've lost our direction. We've lost our way. Because all spiritual blessings are provided by God. Secondly, not only do we not need to lose our focus, we need to count the cost of sin. Satan will pro provide us this picture of, of sin and the pleasures of sin and just make it look like there's not going to be any price to pay for it and that it is far greater than anything else that God can give us. And He will convince us 
that whatever it is and the pleasures and whatever cost that has to be paid, it's just so minimum. It's just so small compared to what we can gain by living in the world and by living after His way and, and by living in sin. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, if you begin in verse 27, Luke chapter 14 and verse 27. He says, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that beholdeth it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. What do we learn from this? Well, we need to be careful not to be a rash builder. We don't want to make a false start. And so as a Christian, if we are already Christians, we've obeyed the gospel. We don't want to make that false start. We've made a commitment to God. We want to follow through with that commitment. We want to see it through. And we want to count the cost and understand that in order to be a Christian, there is a price that must be paid by us in our submission to the will of God. We have to give up our own selfish will and desire and pride, set it aside so that we can serve the Savior. And that is a cost that has to be paid. And that is the price of dedication and commitment unto the Savior. In verse 31, he says, Or what king going to make war against another king set it down not first, and consulteth whether he be able to 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And then he says in verse 34, salt is good. But if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. What do we learn from this? We don't want to be a rash king. We don't want to make a hopeless stand. And so we want to be one that looks at the Christian life, and when we realize that Christ has made the greatest sacrifice, our sacrifice for Him and taking up our own cross is nothing compared to what our Savior has given for us. It's just yet a small, small token in our dedication and commitment unto Him. And so we need to be willing to count that cost. Sometimes we will rationalize our situation. We need to be willing to count the cost of being a Christian in context. And Christianity truly is a very expensive proposition. And sometimes we must give our influence, our money, our energy, our life, and all in order to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we've got to be willing to count that cost. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it tells us that we are not to allow the world to conform us to its mold, but we are to be conformed to the image of Christ and to be transformed into Him, His image and not to be like the world, but to be like Christ, to be like God. And so we need to have that lifestyle. Galatians chapter 6, 7 and 8 tells us that we've got to count that cost and count the cost of sin. We count the cost of what it, what it is to serve Christ and heaven is the reward. That's the cost of discipleship. But then we've got to count the cost of sin. Because on the other end of that spectrum, what is the cost of sin and the ultimate consequence of that sin? We realize that when we sow, we're going to have a harvest. We're going to reap something. And if we sow our life in service to the King, can you imagine what we're going to reap? That's heaven, eternal life. But when you sow to the world and to sin and to living in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and when that's what you sow, you always reap greater than what you sow. Always. 
then the punishment is far greater than what you can imagine. An eternity separated from God. We have to be willing to, to count that cost and count the cost of sin and realize, you know what, it's not worth it. Satan will deceive us. He will convince us, oh yeah, it's, it's nothing. You don't have to, it's very minimal. You don't have to pay anything for this. And he will have you forget the punishment of hell. He will have you forget weeping and gnashing of teeth. We need to be willing to count the cost of sin and realize the real price that has to be paid. And lastly, we need to decide now ahead of time what it is that we're going to do when we get into a compromising situation. When Satan brings about those different temptations upon us, we need to go ahead and, and already know what our decision is going to be. And that's what it means to implant the Word of God in our heart and our mind so that we might not sin against God. So that in those moments, we already know, deeply with, ingrained within us and with, uh, within our subconscious mind, we know what God's Word is. And we're convicted. We believe it. And we've already made a determination as to what path we're going to choose when we find ourselves in that situation. It's too late to wait till we're already in that situation and Satan has already made it good and look good to sit and try to think, okay, now I'm going to try to weigh this thing out because Satan's going to win in that moment of temptation. We've got to be willing ahead of time to study the Word of God, to know His will, so that when we find ourselves there, we can rely upon the strength that we can draw from God's Word written in our heart and in our minds. Young people, you've got to decide before you enter into that temptation. In Matthew chapter 4, when you look at the temptation of our Savior, you're going to find that He quotes the Scriptures. He says it is written. And He does that three times. Now how could He do that? Because he had God's Word written in his memory, etched in his life. And so when you get into that temptation, if you haven't put God's Word there, you can't draw upon it. It's just not there. You can't draw upon what you haven't put there. And so you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt when you find yourself in that situation. You've got nothing from God to draw on and Satan is going to tempt you hard. You'll find yourself sliding to the direction of those temptations to sin. And so you've got to make those decisions before those, those issues face you. You think beforehand, how am I going to react if I'm faced with this temptation? If I'm faced with the temptation to enter into premarital sex, how am I going to deal with that? You need to determine ahead of time that you're going to maintain purity for Christ until you are married. And you determine that and you study about that so that you already know what your decision is. You need to decide ahead of time that you're not going to get wrapped up in drugs and alcohol and any of those things that can take you further than you could ever imagine. You're not even going to begin to entertain those things. And a matter of fact, you're not going to go to the places where people are partaking of those things so that you're not going to be tempted by those things. You're going to be careful who you put in your life and who you're around because if you surround yourself with people that continually are partaking in those things, it's going to be a lot harder. Peer pressure is great and Satan will use it against you. And if you allow those that are around you to push you and push you and push you, before long you'll find yourself in a weakness and in a weak spot and, and there you are. And so be mindful of who you surround yourself with and go ahead and determine that you're going to surround yourself with people that will help you get to heaven, that will encourage you, that will build you up, that will help you be a stronger Christian. If you do that, that will help your journey to heaven. And so the best time to, to make those decisions is now, when you have time to pray, when you have time to study and read and draw from God's Word, not when you are in the midst of the temptation, when you are in the thick of it. Make those determinations now so that you can make that right decision. Wisdom from graduates, and of course it, it applies to all of us. It applies to all of us.
Don't allow Satan to deter your attention one direction or another. To allow you in, in, in a moment of weakness just to make the wrong decision that can literally change the direction of your life. Don't allow Satan. Don't give him that power. You need to count the cost of sin and realize it's far greater. Far greater than you've ever imagined. Satan will convince you it's not, oh, you don't have to pay. There's no cost for this. It's free. But you know the truth. And you need to decide now what it is you're going to do when you enter into those temptations. You need to consider the works of the flesh. Consider those temptations. Think about them beforehand. Study about them so that you know what decision you will make. These are things I believe that can help us, especially those that are embarking upon a new part of their life and they're heading out to begin that new journey as an individual who is separating from parents and, and, and endeavoring in life on their own independently. These are things to consider. Today, if you're not a Christian, that is the number one priority. You need to give your life to the Savior. Believe that truly He is the resurrected Messiah. With your lips, confess that fact. Turn away from your past of sin and rebellion and submit to Him. Be baptized. Be born again of the water and the Spirit, calling upon the name of the Lord so that your sins can be washed away today. Do not put it off. Or maybe you have been one that has failed to use biblical wisdom. You've allowed Satan to take you farther than you ever realized and you need to return home. We have an invitation song that is prepared. Won't you come? Together we stand and as we sing.